Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar hosted by Oculus. My name is Dr. Bill Tulo, Medical Director at Oculus, and I'm really excited tonight to bring to you Dr. Michael Shiglazian. Um, the title of tonight's presentation is Disease Detection with Visual Fields, Fast, Easy, and Precise. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, we encourage you to ask questions. Use the chat board to ask questions, and we left for some time at the end to answer your questions, and we'll answer as many as we can. Uh, tonight's uh, webinar will be recorded. Um, if you need a copy of that, they'll be available uh, via email um, within a week. Um, Michael Chiglazian. Dr. Chiglazian is an associate professor at the Illinois College of Optometry and chief of staff at the Illinois Eye Institute. He's a graduate of the wonderful State University of New York College of Optometry and completed his residency in primary care and ocular disease at Pennsylvania College of Optometry. He's a founding member and currently executive vice president of the Optometric Glaucoma Society. Dr. Shiglazian's clinical practice is focused exclusively on patients with glaucoma and glaucoma-related conditions while co-managing surgical care as well. His interests include research in perimetry, OCT technology, and particularly in the collection of reference database. Without any further ado, Dr. Michael Shiglazian, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Bill Tulo, and thank you to Oculus for the invite uh, to join everyone here this evening and talk about one of my favorite subjects, uh, which is visual field testing. Um, as you heard from Bill's uh, introduction, uh, I am an associate professor. I do a lot of clinical care in the glaucoma realm and world. Uh, perimetry is a big part of that, and that's what we'll be talking a lot about tonight. But uh, visual fields in general are a uh, mainstay and essential in all clinical practices. So uh, I hope that this 45-minute uh, presentation with a Q&A at the end uh, brings a lot of uh, good, solid information to the listeners. Uh, the ability to ask questions later on will be great. And what I want to do is sort of give you a foundation for where visual field testing is today, and, and particularly what Oculus can offer uh, for those of you in clinical practice and how to get uh, a lot out of your devices or the uh, Oculus devices for perimetry testing, uh, which is what we'll be focusing on this evening. So, uh, you know, visual field testing has undergone such a dramatic change in the 25 or 30 years that it has been available for us in clinical practice. Uh, it continues to improve and evolve. And I think it's important for all of us to be updated on what the technology is and how essential it is. Um, it's a primary test for managing and diagnosing glaucoma, as I said but certainly many other ocular neurological diseases and conditions that produce visual field de defects are uh, regularly monitored with perimetry. Um, I would also note that, you know, while we all tend to focus a lot on OCT imaging for glaucoma, uh, for diabetic retinopathy, for macular degeneration, you know, and our OCT is certainly a key device in our uh, clinical practices, uh, visual field testing remains a required part of the evaluation and management for many of our patients, particularly those with glaucoma. And it is essential to have the structural assessment with OCT, as well as the functional assessment that perimetry uh, provides. So we're looking for, you know, the best technologies that do this for us, uh, this visual field assessment and functional assessment of our patient in a, uh, a validated and tested um, uh, methodology in a device that is uh, highly uh, functional and easy to use um, and also uh, comfortable and convenient for the patient. And so there are a lot of different choices out there in the marketplace. I'm not going to review all of the you know different devices for a perimeter or anything like that tonight, uh, but I want to just you know identify that as a fundamental uh, request or a demand that we have for our visual field testing units. And I think uh, as I review our instruments tonight, you'll find that uh, uh, these Oculus devices will meet your needs. So being a little bit more specific, uh, this is, you know, maybe five to 11 reasons under two different categories for why we would test the visual field. Um, glaucoma is certainly number one, uh, but don't forget about all the other neurological conditions that, you know, just happen to show up in your chair and you need some sort of functional assessment of what your patient can see or not see. That helps for you know, referrals to neuro-ophthalmology, neurology itself, um, you know, all sorts of other conditions come into play there. So that's a, that's a whole nother, more than hour lecture on its own, 
we're not going to get too much into neurological conditions tonight, but I want everyone to know that uh, the perimeters and the devices that I'm talking about tonight are threshold devices that would meet all of the needs for these medical-driven reasons to test the visual field. And then if you're uh, more on the functional side, on the vision rehab side, there's certainly a, uh, an important aspect to the uh, delivery of rehab rehabilitation, visual rehabilitation to our patients, where you need to assess the visual field. Now, many times that's still done with kinetic perimetry, such as with a, uh, you know, not really a Goldman uh, perimeter device anymore, those aren't available, but some form of kinetic perimetry. Although still for uh, central field loss in patients with many retinal conditions or optic neuropathies, assessing the central visual field can be done by an automated device. So uh, that's why we're doing uh, the testing that we um, need to do with our devices. Uh, this slide references that, you know, when you're talking about patients, in this case with glaucoma, uh, they have a lot of fears. And I, I think it's, you know, important for us to remember that when we are educating our patients, uh, describing the disease, a condition, uh, that we uh, put them at ease when we can, we appropriately educate them what the risks for the future are, a lot of times that goes with what they can see and not see as based on the visual field testing results. So um, make sure that your office is set up to either sh display information uh, to the patient about their visual field on a monitor. If you're still printing paper, I don't imagine too many places are still doing that, but that could be done. Uh, some sort of methodology to get this in, in front of a patient so that you can ease the fears that they have um, because they hear a disease, a word of a disease like glaucoma, and they have a fear of going blind. Um, and perimetry can often uh, set them at ease, particularly in the early stages of the disease when you reassure them that there's really hardly any effect on the visual field and that with appropriate follow-up care and intervention, you can keep them that way and that you're going to periodically be testing them um, and that visual field testing is an important part of the disease management uh, they need to expect that, and uh, we're going to talk this evening about how you can get them to perform better, better at it. So uh, I think that those are important aspects for us to be aware of. Uh, one of the things I like to refresh everyone's memory about is how we measure the visual field and what we're looking for. Um, I referenced earlier about the limits of a visual field with kinetic perimetry when you're doing a real functional assessment, but typically we're looking at how well the eye sees at various points within the limits of the visual field. So we're looking for defects or scotoma, and they show up mostly like this in early stages, particularly in glaucoma. Um, and there's some you know, misperceptions about how glaucoma really affects the, the, the visual field in the early stages. And it's these you know, dark areas of, of defect and abnormality that are um, quite confounding to patients, uh, difficult to describe, um, and many times they are uh, unnoticeable because of the fellow eye covering up in that portion of the visual field, and the patient is unaware of the field loss in one eye. So a uh, clear identification of a visual field defect is a, is a scotoma um, versus a larger depression is really important for our automated devices to be capable of doing. And I think if you look at uh, this paper here and the, the diagram from the paper, it shows you that you know, what we typically think of glaucoma in the upper right-hand corner here is you know, a, a constriction of the visual field in a, in a tunnel of vision. That's at the very end stage of the disease. Um, most patients are having these blurred parts and black parts of their vision. The brain is then filling this in and the patients really go around not aware of their field loss. And, um, you know, we've seen this and you've seen this in your patients in clinical practice. Uh, it's helpful to try and describe that to the patient and how the visual system works a little bit. And it's also important to remember that, you know, we want our perimeter to identify the scotoma within the field, identify it clearly for us, and then, you know, prevent uh, what the black tunnel is in the upper right-hand corner for those patients with, uh, you know, will only happen in patients at the very end stage of the disease if they get there. I gotta click back here to advance the slide for a second. Um, here is a schematic of the overall dimensions of the visual field, just to remind everyone uh, what the uh, full visual field is, nasally and temporally. With automated perimetry, we're virtually 
uh, only concentrating on the central 30 degrees, uh, sometimes to the uh, temporal side, only 24 degrees, a little bit past the blind spot, which is 15 degrees away from fixation, uh, and then 30 degrees out here nasally. Uh, we know from many papers that uh, most all of field defects and uh, optic uh, nerve pathologies are associated with loss centrally. So we really don't need to do too much testing out here outside of the central 30 degrees for diseases like glaucoma and other optic neuropathies. It's not like things start out here and don't start centrally. In fact, it's really maybe quite the opposite that glaucoma often starts right in here in the central 10 degrees, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, coming up. So visual field defects uh, and depressions named by location. So this is just a reminder for uh, those of you who have you know, forgotten these terms. We don't really use this old term gerum anymore. Uh, we use the term arcuate. This is the curved arcing scotoma that follows the retinal nerve fiber layer pattern over from the blind spot over to the nasal hemifield. And it's these paracentral scotomas that are most frequently seen in the early stages of glaucoma. And sometimes even here, uh, maybe not right at the fovea, but within the central 10 degrees here is where we may see a lot of early field effects uh, in glaucoma, as well as many other optic neuropathies. So the naming and the conventions, uh, there's a variety of different diagrams that you can look at just to remember. Uh, again, I, I think the, the point of information here is like, this is what your perimeter is trying to do for you. And uh, it's important that we understand um, that we want to be able to identify this arcuate scotoma as clearly and quickly and as efficiently as possible. Now, uh, I'm not talking about a lot of the new options in perimetry that have become available in the past year or so. Um, I think that it's you know very early days for these head-mounted perimeters. I've tried two or three of them. Uh, I do have some you know mostly favorable initial impressions, but these are uh, still in development, in my opinion. There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of uh, testing and validation, in my opinion, to be done. But you know I think it's something for everyone to pay a little bit of attention to. Um, for right now, I am relying on my traditional perimetry devices. Um, that may change in the future. Um, you know, there may be some advantages because these headset devices do other things besides testing the visual field, but really uh, they've not been fully validated. There's no real papers or publications on them. Uh, they have a very limited dynamic range, so they're not really geared at this time for patients with moderate to severe visual field defects. Uh, most of them have no real progression analysis, so that's a problem. Um, you know, maybe in some settings uh, they might be okay, uh, but again, I think you have to stop very carefully and, and, and have very, very careful consideration. Um, I would really recommend for the most part that people think about, you know, this, you know, coming to be something in the future uh, to pay attention to it, but that for right now, uh, traditional perimetry, small desktop, um, efficient devices such as the Oculus Easy Field really meet the needs of most clinical practices. And uh, this is well validated, well tested, um, very well made, uh, very um, uh, sturdy and substantial, at least in my experience. Uh, that's been my personal experience in using device for a while. And, um, uh, and patients respond very well to it. Uh, you know, paying attention to what head-mounted perimetry may offer us in the future, but uh, maybe not quite there just yet. Um, so choosing uh, what you do with the uh, with any perimeter, but you know we'll focus on the uh, easy field here tonight, uh, is choosing a test pattern. And so you know we've been um, and appropriately so built around these traditional grids or test patterns, the 24-2 and the 10-2. Uh, these just happen to be uh, report printouts from the uh, Humphrey Field Analyzer. You would see similar things from the Octopus. Uh, visual field testing unit, you see the same things on an easy field uh, testing unit, and I will show you those coming up. But, you know, this is what I mean by selecting a grid. 24-2 uh, remains to be the uh, most common uh, testing grid pattern that I select. It does, as I said, go out to 30 degrees nasally, only 24 degrees uh, temporally because we don't need to test that side of the visual field. And it removes that outer ring of points that the 30-2 grid had that is just really a waste of time at this point. And then when you see a full circle, look carefully because it'll probably say a 10 degree field. And this is the 10-2 pattern 
where we've put test points in much closer together. So there's only two degrees of separation between the test points on a 10-2 grid versus six degrees of separation. And uh, we'll get into the science behind that in a little bit, but it's become important that we test most patients with early stage glaucoma with a 10-2 to identify early central field defects. Again, all of these options are available on the Easy Field uh, and other Oculus perimeters. And uh, again, I'll leave it to them to answer more uh, specific questions about the unit, but uh, I've been using the unit for uh, quite a while now and I'm uh, pleased with how it replicates my testing uh, patterns and strategies from other devices that I uh, have been using for a long time as well. Uh, so this gets in now into the little bit of the science of the need for that 10-2 uh, grid. What you're looking at here is a fundus photo, of course, and the central 20 degree circle here. Uh, and I, unfortunately, this red circle got offset a little bit. Uh, that red circle should be centered right around the fovea, and this would be the central 10 degrees, uh, showing you that there's really only, uh, you know, within the central 20 degrees, 16 points that are being tested. And on central 10 degrees, it's even fewer than that. So we just don't have enough test locations to accurately identify early small paracentral defects that occur regularly in patients with glaucoma. So the bottom line is, is that doing a 10-2 pattern is really quite essential. This is the uh, anatomy. Uh, this is identified and published by Don Hood from Columbia University. He terms it the macular zone of vulnerability, uh, reminding us that the macular zone is highly vulnerable in our patients with glaucoma. And you will miss uh, patients with early disease uh, with just doing a 24-2 grid. So most of the recommendation remains still today that you know if a patient is a decent test taker and they've done well on a 24-2 grid and you've not found a defect, um, and in particular if they have OCT loss on their central macular scan, so their so-called ganglion cell complex or ganglion cell analysis scan, then you definitely want to do a 10-2 grid so that you can identify these uh, close and central defects that happen within fixation. Um, this is classic structure and function. So when you're talking perimetry, you're generally not just talking perimetry by itself, you're talking perimetry with a disc photograph and OCT images and you're working through, okay, I've looked at the optic disc in A, I see a notching to the neuroretinal rim, I see neurofiber layer dropout, um, I see uh, a paracentral scotoma on the pattern deviation plot, that little black square there, it's actually both on the total and the pattern deviation. That one little defect there that would be highlighted better on a 10-2 grid, it just happened to be caught on this 24-2 grid, um, then we know corresponds to the inferior temporal nerve fiber bundle defect. It's shown here on the quadrant plot of abnormality and thinning on the OCT, and then also on the ganglion cell analysis image from the macular region. So all those things put together, that's what your perimetry should be uh, working towards integration with the other devices in your office for glaucoma patients. So we've talked about choosing a testing grid. You also need to choose a test strategy. Lots of, um, you know, uh, sometimes debate or different uh, choices for a screening field versus a threshold field versus the newer optimized threshold fields that perform tests in a much faster, more efficient time frame. Uh, this is a, a, a slide specifically for the Oculus Easy field, and I've highlighted the two testing uh, strategies and uh, along with their grids, if you will, uh, that I use most regularly and most frequently. Um, mostly today, I've gotten away from using screening strategies. I know that some people still like to use screening strategies in the office. Um, you can use a quick 20-point screening. Uh, that's, you know, that's one practice management style is to screen everybody in your practice. Uh, I generally think about, I do a careful, thorough, comprehensive examination. And if I see a need to do a visual field, it's usually identified by something that I've caught in the case history or the clinical exam. I get it that it's not all the time, but um, if I have a suspicion of anything, then I'm jumping to a threshold pattern. What I've highlighted here is the enhanced or optimized version of threshold testing on the easy field called the spark precision testing. 
and that has 67 test points in the central 24, 30 degrees. It's only three minutes test time, and you get the best accuracy for you know not a very long test. So I think it's the best optimization between a screening test that is not well suited for uh, identifying uh, subtle defects. Yes, it's gonna find a significant, dense, gross, uh, large defect, but most of the time I'm uh, narrowing down and choosing to do a, a threshold type of strategy. Here are some of the screening uh, test results from the easy field. Uh, this is the screening 24-2 pattern. You can see on the right, the field is normal. You can see on the left that there are a number of uh, test points, all the black boxes that were abnormal. You put them together in their appropriate shape and you can identify the pattern and, uh, and the location of the field defect and perhaps tie it into the suspected disease overall. Uh, but I do wanna uh, talk about this spark threshold strategy that is uh, proprietary to the easy field. Um, it's something that I've uh, really found quite favorable and well received by my patients and also has compared quite favorably to my uh, experience with other visual field testing devices. And again, what, uh, you know, what a lot of the device manufacturers in perimetry have done is optimize the traditional uh, staircase methodology for thresholding. That is, we're trying to identify what's the patient's you know, retinal, retinal sensitivity measured in decibels um, at all of these test points, up to you know, 59 to 67 test locations in a very short test time. And you have to integrate some algorithms and some uh, predictions uh, to do that quickly and efficiently. And that's what Spark is, and that's why I like Spark Precision. Um, it's gonna give me test results virtually all of the time in about three minutes. Um, it's been well validated, there are papers published on it, um, and it's well tuned for my glaucoma patients and the few neurological patients that I see, or if I'm gonna be sending patients out for neurological examinations. Um, so it's, it's really quite easy and rapid, and uh, I think the technology that uh, is incorporated in the software here is really an important component of why I'm looking at certain devices. So it's, um, it's very well defined, and it, it really, I won't get too much into the science of how it works. It's uh, above and beyond a, a one-hour uh, a presentation uh, this evening or 45 minute presentation this evening, but basically it has a very smart strategy for working through the visual field. Um, yes, uh, published that it's about two minutes faster than CETA, uh, very predictable in the duration of the test, um, highly repeatable, and also can be integrated with its uh, proprietary progression analysis called TNT or threshold noiseless trend progression. And so combining those two things, a very accurate um, uh, uh, thresholding uh, uh, algorithm is key, as well as the uh, ability to monitor for progression. Here is uh, articles in literature. So again, when I'm given something by a device manufacturer, I don't take them at their word for it. I do my research, I go to the literature, I see what's published, I see what the experts in the industry are saying, and I'm looking for you know, something published in good journals that are identifying the accuracy and sensitivity in a number of patients. So it's not just not my um, um, you know, impressions of marketing and other pieces of information. And, and again, Spark has that, so I think that's tremendous. Um, and then I'm gonna spend less time here tonight uh, just due to the time on the progression part of uh, TNT, but just so that everyone knows that if you do get into uh, ongoing care and management of patients you know, with glaucoma, of course, or other diseases, uh, a progression analysis program is really um, essential today. You know, 10 years ago, they were not widely available. Uh, with the advent of uh, progression analysis, both from Humphrey, Octopus, and other perimeters, uh, it's really the standard of care for which you need to monitor patients as they um, live with their disease and you're treating them over time. And so just be aware that there is this TNT uh, algorithm and uh, module application within the Oculus Easy field. This is sort of what it looks like and uh, you, know, you can uh, become more schooled at a later time and get in depth here as to how to read this display to identify a patient who is progressing over time. You know, after making the diagnosis, uh, you know, I usually say that's the easy thing to do. Uh, but following a patient over time and using these graphs, and I'm sure that, you know, this type of uh, 
Bebe curve and, and uh, index curve is not familiar for many of you, uh, but the displays uh, in TNT and with the Oculus uh, are really quite intuitive with a little bit of uh, review and training to show you what's going on. And I think that will give you then, you know, the full complement of everything that you need to manage patients from disease detection to disease management. And I realize that everyone has, you know, different comfort threshold for taking care, taking care of glaucoma patients. Uh, some may just be more concerned about the diagnosis. Uh, Spark and the uh, Oculus Easy Field is great for that. For those of you who are managing more uh, moderate, stage, uh, moderate stage disease patients with glaucoma over time, uh, you have the TNT, uh, and again, backed up in the literature to help support you there. So one of the things that we struggle with uh, a lot of our patients, and I think that's why head-mounted perimetry, virtual reality perimetry is, you know, making some headway here is that, you know, patients have bad perceptions about doing a visual field test. I think sometimes ourselves as uh, clinicians and perimetrists and our technicians in our office have negative uh, impressions of perimetry. So uh, these slides here really talk about the staff attitudes and um, how we need to up our game about how we talk to our patients and take a better role in explaining to patients why this test is so important. Um, how that, you know, with the right uh, newer thresholding algorithms like Spark, it's only going to be about three minutes per eye, but that it is really essential to their disease management. And if we are positive about it and our offices and our technicians are uh, positive about it, then our patients will be able to get through these tests um, more uh, accurately um, and give us better data. That's going to help them out in the long run. So uh, I also think that they have to be very comfortable in front of the device. Um, and the Oculus Easy Field is one of those devices where it's uh, very easy to set up for the patient and um, uh, very open, not enclosed, uh, can be done in a, a regularly illuminated room. Um, and so it's very comfortable and easy for most patients. And uh, my patients have responded very well for it. It's certainly, you know, those, those negative connotations come from some patients who've been doing visual field testing for a long time. And they remember the dark old days of a traditional threshold test that could take 12 minutes or 14 minutes per eye. It just, you know, really was sort of a torture test back then. But um, standardizing things, uh, training your technicians, giving patients good instructions, letting them know what to be, what to be expected, and how to manage it efficiently in your office is all part of making perimetry successful for you uh, in your practice. And you know this goes across whatever device that you are using. Uh, okay, so back to visual field defects. Um, this is just another good photo that came from some of the papers that really changed our understanding of how a glaucomatous visual field defect really is perceived by a patient. So on side A here, you have a patient and you see the patient, uh, sorry, you have a, uh, a person in the patient's field of view with a normal visual field, normal grayscale, uh, and a person in the crosswalk, and they are visible. The, on the right side is a person with glaucoma, a superior nasal step, and while their brain fills in that picture, the patient is in the scotoma and it's just sort of blocked out and the person does not see that patient in the crosswalk. But it's just not like a dark black area. It's not a tunnel of vision. This is the more realistic way that patients with early to moderate stage glaucoma are seeing things and perceiving things on a daily basis with their visual functioning. So hence why it's so important for us to really get in there and get to uh, identify, uh, you know, find these defects and uh, counsel our patients, guide our patients, and of course, you know, manage and treat our patients accordingly as is needed. Uh, more terminology here on where visual field defects come from on our 24-2 grid pattern. Uh, so nasal step area, uh, germ or arcuate areas are both in here, and then the paracentral area that I uh, talked about as well. So if you divide up that 24-2 uh, dash, dash grid, this is where we get some of the terminology from. It goes back uh, a couple decades now. Here's other patterns of defects that you can see on uh, any printout showing you sort of, you know, this, the different appearance of glaucomatous uh, visual field defects. An inferior nasal step, 
a superior arcuate scotoma, a central defect on the top right, uh, a, not, a very common early central field defect in glaucoma. Notice how it's respecting or resting on the horizontal midline while almost crossing the vertical midline and going over into the nasal step area. So uh, like, as I said earlier, a 10-2 would help enhance this and identify even more abnormal test points. And that's where our patient's visual function is. So we need to know more about it and we need to track it more closely. And then here's uh, what we would call an early nasal step uh, for a patient. Just uh, more examples of what we see on grayscales for glaucomatous field defects. Uh, pretty common terminology there. Um, so this is, uh, and I apologize, I'm just recognizing the staging here is from the old coding system, the ICD-9 system. Uh, these all are now new with update to the ICD-10 coding system. What I'm getting at here, let me see if it's on the next slide. No, it's just here. Uh, this is how we stage glaucoma with our coding system. So if you're not aware, Stage uh, group, uh, box one here is mild stage glaucoma and there's no field defect. So we definitely diagnose glaucoma when there's no field loss, but we have OCT damage, optic nerve head changes, significant IOP or other risk factors. And this is mild stage. Boxes two and three are moderate stage, probably what many of us would, might have called early stage 10 years ago, but this is definitely moderate stage. And then box four down here is uh, uh, severe stage glaucoma. So the only thing that's really wrong here is that these coding numbers in the left-hand bo blue box here are the older uh, ICD-10 system. So I apologize for that. I have to update that to the new uh, ICD-10 numbers. But that's staging for glaucoma. Uh, here's where we get our visual field defect uh, patterns from, from, of course, the retinal nerve fiber bundle. This is just drawn out on this fundus photo for the left eye. Uh, and uh, the you know, region in A and in B, the arcuate zone, and B, the paracentral zone. A little bit of, C, well, C here is just identifying the horizontal raffe. Uh, again, that old anatomical term uh, just is a dividing line in the retina. And that's why the visual field defects that I showed you back here and here are all respecting the horizontal midline or horizontal raffe, highly characteristic of glaucoma. When it's not happening, be careful. It might not be glaucoma. It might be something else. It might be artifact. But, you know, most, you know, moderate stage glaucoma, until it crosses over and affects both hemifields, which it can, and obviously in the more advanced stages, uh, this would be classical for the early to moderate stage of glaucoma. Uh, and this is just one of my favorite uh, long time uh, diagrams from the Doug Anderson uh, perimetry textbook that shows you how things are working and where you know the grayscale patterns are coming from. But let's get uh, get on with glaucoma assessment and you know one example here uh, you can't really see much of any uh, optic nerve head glaucoma changes on this photograph and that's often the case. Uh, we would certainly want to integrate OCT imaging you know as I said everything is done structure and function together. But the visual field here in this overview report is showing you what, is, uh, what one type of uh, progress is for the development of an early nasal step. From a couple of isolated points here in the nasal region to a few more of them to even more. And then you can start to see that this is connecting back into the arcuate zone leading back to the blind spots. Now, nasal steps are not always the first defect. I highlighted for you earlier that some patients show up with these paracentral scotomas that are very close to fixation. Sometimes we think that happens more in patients with normal tension glaucoma, but really it can happen in anyone. And if you do more 10-2 testing, you will find uh, more of those types of defects. Uh, we looked at this slide earlier. Again, structure and function fitting together. Uh, that's uh, to make perimetry work best for you in, in your practice. Uh, I get lots of questions about reading and interpreting visual field test results. Uh, it's sometimes not an easy answer because I don't have all the information when I get these consults and I'm often asking the practitioner, well, does it correlate with what you saw in the back of the eye? Does it correlate with a photograph that you may have taken or does it correlate with your OCT? Well, I don't have an OCT in the office. Well, then you're sort of stuck of like, you better be able to look at the optic nerve and try and identify what you're seeing there. Uh, of course, repeating a visual field test 
um, even for a threshold test, repetition really helps to confirm. And we know about learning effect with visual fields for all devices. Um, so it's pretty common for me for a glaucoma suspect to repeat that first visual field within two or three months. You know, sometimes a little bit more than that, but that's generally the timeline where I want to get my two baseline tests uh, of good quality in sort of a close time frame. So two or three months, maybe up to four months apart to confirm that the defect that I'm suspicious of, and again, I may be diagnosing glaucoma without a field defect, I would still get two baseline tests within the, those first four months. Again, presuming the patient is a good test taker, I've given them good instructions, I take a positive attitude towards doing the visual field, I'm selecting a testing algorithm like Spark, I'm doing a 24-2 grid, I may have to do two 24-2s and then follow it up with a 10-2. That's one of my strategies to you know, do this extra testing, which I, again, I know is a burden. I'm not saying it lightly, but I wanna reiterate that it is still part of the practice patterns for glaucoma. So here's an example uh, with a Spark a test from the Oculus Easy field that I've been using. Uh, this is a patient with a basically mild stage, uh, maybe a little bit beyond that because I am starting to see a field defect here uh, on this patient. So this actually is more moderate stage. Apologize for the uh, uh, mislabeling on this slide. Uh, mild stage would be a perfectly normal visual field. And actually, I'm highlighting with my arrows the abnormal test points. You can see it on the grayscale. You can see the red values on the dB scale up here. So um, that's, you know, that's the one great thing about the Oculus Easy Field. Reading this report is just like looking at any other, again, if you've looked at Humphrey or Octopus uh, visual field test reports, it's laid out the same way. This is your total deviation, your uh, pattern deviation plot. You're looking for key localized field defects on, the, uh, on this grid down here. You don't really have to look too much at the decibel values on the, uh, on the two plots up above. Um, so, you know, I don't look too much at those. These will be, you know, shaded for you for the key test points that are abnormal. This is early stage, but it looks like there really is a defect there technically probably might want to call that moderate stage based on the coding system I showed you earlier. Okay, let's just see if I can get my slide to advance here while I have my pointer on. No, it doesn't like doing that. So back to here and clicking. There we go. Okay, large cupping suspect, uh, normal IOP. Certainly this optic disc and cupping is gonna get everyone's attention. Uh, you know, if you don't have OCT, again, visual fields, particularly threshold visual fields for this type of case, not a screening visual field. This is, you know, you've identified a potential problem. You're not just screening a normal random patient in general practice on a yearly wellness exam. Um, you've got a potential problem. You need something like Spark Precision uh, optimize threshold test, get the test done in, you know, three minutes and 12 seconds in this case, uh, thresholding all these test points and proceeding very quickly through it and getting you information that there's no field defect here at this point in time. Again, I will, I will say that, we, you know, it doesn't rule out glaucoma 100%, but with normal pressure, I'd probably measure the disc size on this patient if I, I could at the sit lamp, identify a large disc, large cupping, an in, intact neural retinal rim, um, probably not glaucoma, but you know, use other risk factors as well. Uh, this is a patient with primary open angle glaucoma, uh, also a little bit of a large disc, a very large cup, and more importantly, a very thin uh, neural retinal rim. And difficult to see where the neural retinal rim is thinnest. Um, and so uh, I, you know, as much as I, you know, tell all my students and residents, get good at looking at the optic nerve. I know it can be difficult and you can't always see everything uh, on these photographs. OCTs do help a lot. But in this case, the visual field tells you where to look because the visual field here shows a very dense, inferior, arcuate uh, glaucomatous defect. And it tells me that there's a lot of rim thinning to the superior temporal rim in this patient. It looks similar to what I see down here. So I'm always comparing the superior pole to the inferior pole but clearly the visual field um, you know, tells me what's functionally happening to this patient and that reflects structurally what's happening, even though it can be deceiving in some of these patients. 
Um, I do know that it matched up very well with this patient's OCT, and uh, that would you know put pull the whole picture together. So uh, look at the grayscale, look at the uh, decibel plot. Also look down here at the uh, deviation uh, range plot and the uh, corrected deviation plot or the pattern deviation plot as I call it down here in the lower right. It shows you where that defect is. It was a spark precision test and I think it just took like three minutes or so. Uh, patients with very severe disease such as this patient can still be tested and evaluated. You know, you're gonna get more artifact and bad results, but um, you can still you know, get some sense of what's happening to your patient functionally. So general guidelines that I would recommend for patients in uh, doing glaucoma suspects in visual field testing, as I've emphasized, threshold strategy, preferably when it's optimized, like a spark strategy for shorter test time. The idea is more frequent tests, believe it or not, because when you get to the progression analysis, more tests really help you determine what the change over time is or the rate of progression. And we now measured glaucoma disease by its rate of progression. Definitely with a 24-2 grid, not the older 30-2 grid, a 10-2 grid for many patients, especially those with central uh, OCT loss on the uh, ganglion cell complex scan. Um, get them good fixation, strive for low false positives, that's key. Uh, I'm again repeating in three to six months for many patients. Then again in another six months, I may get three tests in a 12 to 14 month uh, time zone. And then uh, you know continue on testing for patients with disease um, uh, to identify what their overall rate of progression um, using everything in conjunction with the OCT and photo. So a couple more minutes left here and I'll do a case or two and then uh, we'll take a break for questions. So this 62-year-old uh, white female was referred in for high eye pressure. Uh, she had problems because the other office did not accept her insurance. Uh, she was recorded on uh, uh, NCT with a pressure of 30 and 28. There's no family history. There's no medical conditions. These are the color photographs. So a relatively healthy looking optic disc just from these flat uh, photographs, a good sharp disc margin, a small cup, no obvious glaucoma. Uh, this is the OCT that I was using that day. And um, we can either look just at the color map very briefly down here with the red, yellow, and blue. Uh, that's the RNFL thickness map. Or anything that's abnormal is going to show up in this green box up here called the RNFL probability plot. And it's inverted on this, uh, on this type of report here. So basically, the OCT for the right eye is normal. The OCT for the left eye is normal. The, th the color map looks good. The probability map looks good. Just a scattered defect down here of this little, little red point. And I uh, tested a visual field with the Oculus Easy Field, got normal test results. And uh, despite the fact that the patient had very high pressure at this point in time, does not have any disease um, that I was able to identify. So um, pressures are high. Um, we did go ahead and start treating her for ocular hypertension, but we were able to complete a workup, including visual fields here, uh, to get good test results overall. And just as a point of comparison, uh, I also tested the patient back uh, last year uh, with the Humphrey field analyzer that I use. I got the same results, did not find any field defects on the Humphrey field analyzer using their CETA fast strategy. So I have a lot of examples here where I'm uh, integrating my uh, Oculus Easy field in with my traditional perimetry, which is the Humphrey Field Analyzer. Uh, this is a patient with more advanced stage glaucoma, uh, really in both eyes. It's actually more advanced in this left eye over here with uh, severe rim thinning and cupping. The OCT shows you know, lots of RNFL loss and ganglion cell loss. Um, and the field on the Oculus Easy field, surprisingly, uh, again, look at that right photo and the OCT. It shows you how much lag there is between visual field defects and OCT loss. If you look at the right eye over here, uh, the left eye though, on the Oculus Easy Field, uh, you know, severe stage glaucoma in the left eye. The right eye is headed that way. Um, we have to, you know, treat this patient aggressively and perform uh, frequent visual fields. Here's putting everything together for you. So photograph, OCT, visual field, uh, when you can do that and you have you know, your office set up to get those images on a computer screen, that's great. Uh, for comparison, 
Here's how the patient did on the Humphrey Field Analyzer with quite a long test time of seven minutes and 23 seconds for that left eye and basically the same results. Um, one or two more cases and we're done. Uh, this is a newly diagnosed patient with high eye pressure, uh, had a retinal vein occlusion in the left eye, has some abnormality there, but also has glaucoma. And uh, the Oculus Easy field was just able to identify, you know, this cluster defect, gonna wanna repeat this. I just did this test a, a short while ago, repeat and confirm this, but it looks like it's identifying an inferior, an early inferior nasal step in this patient's left eye. The left eye is the eye with more OCT loss. I just have to sort of sort out, there's a collateral vessel in there from an old uh, retinal vein occlusion, and you have to be careful about you know, coexisting ocular diseases and conditions. Uh, and again, for comparison's sake, really found uh, the same thing with the Humphrey Field Analyzer. And uh, this patient is moderate stage glaucoma. Uh, these are photographs of both right and left discs. Uh, OCT loss just in the left eye. Uh, visual field defects in both eyes. Uh, inferiorly, uh, you know, tracked really well with, uh, uh, with the easy field. And last case is just uh, another patient with, you know, definitive glaucomatous cupping on the photographs inferiorly with large notching. Uh, significant uh, OCT loss in the right eye, early stage in the left eye, and the visual fields uh, go along with that. Here's the field defect from the Oculus Easy field. I've highlighted and circled it, um, quite apparent there, and maybe just an early field defect coming up in the uh, left eye as well. So uh, just maybe one or two minutes over, apologize for that, but uh, we're at the question and discussion time. Um, thanks everyone. Great job, Michael. This was really fascinating. And I have some questions I want to uh, ask. Um, one is uh, actually something I think you should reiterate. I think it's important. I think that you you highlighted it at the end after this question was asked and answered. But um, regarding the 10-2, um, I think you said that you will do at least two 24-2s before you will switch to the 10-2. But you want to just reiterate the uh, when you yeah. start thinking about the 10-2? Yeah, I start thinking about it right away. Um, and I am always, I won't say that I have one single strategy, right? Of course, there's not just one answer to this, to this very good question. Um, sometimes I feel like, uh, depending, I think I don't know if I can even give a short answer, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I start thinking about a 10-2 and when I'm going to do it right away. But sometimes, to me, uh, getting two 24-2s might be more important than getting that 10-2. It really depends on the patient, the risk, what's uh, what I'm seeing on the OCT, um, how good a test taker that patient is. So all of those things factor into that. I, and I, I, I say that because I've seen a lot of patients where sometimes um, the 10-2 is very important, don't get me wrong, but sometimes practitioners do it at the cost of not getting enough 24-2s. Mm. And so that's where my hesitation is. So in that example, I said two 24s and then a 10. But I'll say, you know, if I'm still trying to make a diagnosis, I I'll might say to myself, well, I did a 24. I didn't find anything. Maybe my next thing is to do a 10-2 and my second test would be a 10-2. But that's still sort of in the early diagnosis state. If I know the patient has glaucoma and I, you know, I'm going to treat them because the pressure is 32, there's definite OCT loss, I see a notch on the optic nerve. Um, to me, sometimes establishing the 24-2 baseline is really going to help me out two or three years down the road when mm -hmm. I, I'm looking for my progression analysis. And that's why I said it that way, answered it that way. Excellent. Um, I'm going to throw out a couple of confounding issues for practitioners, and I just want you to comment on each of them. Okay. Um, pupil dilation, no pupil dilation during mm -hmm. the field. Um, either. Of course, <laughs> not just one answer. <laughs> um, keep it consistent. Okay. Uh, most, you know, patients uh, at, with at least a three millimeter pupil don't need to be dilated. Uh, elderly patients with very small pupils and cataracts and doing 10-2s, they probably need to be, be to, to be dilated. 
Most patients, I don't dilate though. You know, 50, 60, even most 70 year olds, you know, I start to slow down my visual field testing on 80 year olds, of course. But there are some patients with very small pupils, less than three millimeters in a cataract and dilation does uh, help the field testing results, uh, particularly on the 10-2. How, how, uh, how do you account or consider cataracts um, during the visual field? A patient has significant nucleosclerosis. How do you interpret pattern deviation? And so, yeah, I didn't, show, I didn't show examples of that tonight. Unfortunately, I apologize. That is one of the, one of the basic things. You use the uh, total, I'll, I'll use the, I apologize, the, uh, well, maybe I can go back to an example. Here we go. You use the uh, deviation rate from age map here. This is the lower right-hand plot, right? Uh, sorry, lower left-sided yeah. plot. Uh, and then the corrected deviation plot. Cataract shows up just on the one to the left. Uh, glaucomatous field defects will show up on both or, um, or only the right. Only the right. No, no. If it's only the right, it's high false positives. So if there's a cataract, you'll see cataract and glaucoma on the left, glaucoma only on the right. Got you. I, I'm sure I confused everybody no. right now because I really need a visual example. But you know, listen, cataracts can be a real problem, and uh, but this the this corrected deviation plot will typically show the glaucomatous defect hidden and masked by the cataractus uh, depression that will be seen here uh, to the plot on the lower left. I've got that. You know, it's in the video. It's in the tape or recording. I think that's clear. Um, <laughs> How do you um, consider and handle corneal thickness when measuring IOP? And then what is, I mean, I assume you're a Goldman IOP um, Yeah, I am, but you know, I, I am very open to other modalities of tonometry these days. So I, I used to be very strict Goldman Bill, um, you know, but uh, I will use eye care. I will use a new Tono pen, uh, one of the Avia devices. Mm -hmm. um, but eye care is highly repeatable, and I don't use it for treating and managing my long-term glaucoma patients, but uh, uh, those tonometers are great in general practice. How do you incorporate corneal thickness with that? Well, you don't do anything with your corneal thickness value to change your IOP number. Okay. You don't recalculate. You don't use a grid or a graph or some other piece of paper that a company feel, gave you. A lot of right. people still doing that, yeah. I know. It's horrible. Um, the only thing you do is you assign risk based, based on the OATS ocular hypertension study that says that patients with ocular hypertension, that is pressure over 22, and a thin cornea under 555 microns, those patients are at higher risk. So somewhere down around 520, 500, those patients, if they are ocular hypertensive, they are at high risk for glaucoma. And that's really all we know. We don't know what the real pressure is. We don't have a manometer to go into their anterior chamber and measure their true pressure. That's all I do. Thick cornea, low risk. Thin cornea, high risk. I should say thick cornea is over 500, 588 microns. So 555 low, 588 is a high end. In the middle, just average risk. And I would also always recommend the online OAT risk calculator, which you can Google and use. That's what you do with your pachymetry findings. Put them into the OATS risk calculator. It's an online calculator. It's free, and that will tell you what your patient's risk of developing glaucoma is from ocular hypertension in the next five years. I have one more question for you, and this is an interesting question. How do you coach your perimetrists, your technicians, when a patient repeatedly gets false positive or false negatives? Um, what do you do yeah. to help improve this situation? These are great questions tonight, Bill. Really, really good ones. Uh, point on. Um, and another time, I wish I had a magic answer for that. Uh, you know, I think at the start of, uh, and I skipped over that part of my slide deck a little bit because I didn't want to get too bogged down with, you know, what sometimes may be perceived as basic stuff, but letting your patients know that A, they should push the response button even when they think they are just seeing a very dim light. A lot of patients don't want to push it unless it's very bright. Then you have the opposite, the, you know, clicker happy patients. I no longer say trigger happy because that's... Mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> Trigger, it's triggering. 
<laughs> uh, clicker happy. I don't know if that's any better, but anyways. Um, and I tell them, uh, you know, just, what do I tell them? I tell them, you know, only push the button when you are really sure you're hitting, you are seeing a light flash on and off in front of you. And yeah, you know, there's some patients who just don't get it. And there's probably 10%, 15% of patients in my practice who no matter what I say to them, they just are always gonna have too high false positives. It's great that the question came out because it gives me a chance to remind everyone, a visual field test with over 15% high false positives, not very accurate. And you're gonna miss defects that are probably, that are perhaps hidden there. Excellent. Well, that wraps up our questions. Uh, Michael, great job tonight. Really fantastic. I learned a tremendous amount, as I always do when we speak. Um, and again, thank you so much tonight. And good night, everyone. And thanks for your questions. Thank you, Bill.